welcome back to my YouTube channel. I recently went to my school and they had some Vietnam War veterans come. And I found out while in the process of making this video is one of the three war veterans didn't want his stories put onto the internet. So I had to cut them out. So if you guys notice any changes in the frames, anything like that, don't worry about that. And I hope you guys can make some use of this video and enjoy. Um, make sure everything's in order with cameras. I think everything's set up. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you for coming today. This is the second time we've done this at Duluth High School. We did it last year with Dr. Jim Markham. Uh, and uh, Mr. Fink came as well, and we had an incredible time. It was an amazing experience for the kids that were there. Uh, we didn't have near this larger group, but that's uh, that's awesome that we uh, we've had such a good turnout. Um, these uh, these gentlemen are America's heroes. These guys are the ones who have uh, given of themselves. I know they're looking around at each other, going, "Where, where?" <laughs> that's the thing about these gentlemen is they are very humble. Uh, and uh, it's a real treat and a pleasure to have them come out. And I, honestly, I think I'm probably more excited than anybody else in the room uh, to hear the stories that these gentlemen have to share with us. Uh, we'll get started with, uh, well, for my students, you know, we talk about uh, icebreaker questions and just kind of getting the juices flowing. So uh, what we're going to do first is let each of these gentlemen introduce themselves, uh, maybe share your rank uh, and where you were born, uh, where you're from, what hometown and uh, then we'll go from there. We'll pass the microphone around the students and uh, let them have a few questions with you if that's okay. All right, let's get started. Uh, I ended up uh, getting drafted in 1968 and instead of just getting drafted, I uh, went ahead and signed up to be an Army helicopter pilot because a neighbor of mine, he's a little bit dumber than me and he made it, so. <laughs> Ended up in Vietnam, uh, end of 68 through the end of 69. Came back, taught students uh, down at uh, Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, that's my hometown. Uh, 71, they rifted everybody, didn't have a college degree. So you can't be a helicopter pilot without having a hot college degree. <laughs> uh, ended up in uh, 1983, needed some kind of retirement. Uh, just looked at it, I missed the helicopters, and I got back in the uh, Georgia National Guard, then went to the Hawaii National Guard, uh, came back to Georgia, and while I was in the Georgia Guard, went to Iraq in uh, 2004, spent the whole year there, and ended up uh, retiring out of the Georgia National Guard in 2005. Uh, currently, uh, I'm a life flight helicopter pilot in the Atlanta area. Uh, my name is Bob Pollock, uh, so for a lot of you, um, draft calls were 90,000 a month, month after month after month after month after month, 68 and 69. Uh, five has decided we choose our service, went to the Navy. I just lost one of five three weeks ago, uh, beige and orange. Uh, I went in uh, June 69, did four years, uh, enlisted in the Navy, uh, was stationed in Kingsville, Texas, had orders to Vietnam in 72, patrol squadron. And a buddy of mine, his brother got killed. They gave him a sole surviving son discharge, and they canceled my orders. And so I stayed in Texas. Uh, went back to UT with the GI Bill, 74. One of the smartest things I did was I joined the reserves, uh, retired as a chief, command chief, for 29 years in 1998. Uh, got great orders to the Arctic on board a ship. Uh, served on several ships, twice in Scotland. Uh, my family's from Northern Ireland, that was great. Got to see relatives, uh, got a lot of great travel. Uh, but in active for the first four years, so basically, saw Texas. So, um... Um, we're gonna take some time now and pass the microphone around. I know some of my students and some of the other students who we ask you to have at least a couple good questions. And uh, we'll try and do it as orderly as possible. Uh, if anybody wants to break the ice and ask the first question, you got one right over here. Um, what, do you, what do you think about JF? Why do you think JFK was assassinated? <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to find 
find something a little more relevant here. Let's see. I will say, I'm not one, I know a couple teachers here think they need to bring the draft back. I would, I would never subscribe to that, but several years ago there were two articles in the Atlanta Journal Constitution. One was about, you know, we've been drafted since 75, and then a few pages later there's an article of worst race relations uh, since the 60s, and they didn't connect the two. And I know when I went in the Navy to boot camp, summer 69, Everybody except one guy in my outfit, 84 people, in Orlando, Florida. Everybody was from the South. And that was the first time a lot of blacks and whites had gotten together. Now, I'd never met a Filipino in my life until I went to the Navy. And the same with Hispanics. And th there were a lot of Spanish from Texas. There were a number of Filipinos. Um, in fact, the best friend I had was in Texas. Uh, joined the U.S. Navy, a lot of people in the Philippines did, did 20 years, and I was naive enough to try to find him in San Diego, California years ago. I thought his name would stand out. There were three pages in the phone book with his name. Big Naval Base there. And they, but um, as far as civil rights, there was a lot that the military did, because I mean, we were told the first day, I mean, they shaved your hair. It, it took no skill to be a Navy barber. For new recruits. Uh, exactly. And the five of us that went in, we were staggered. And one of my friends that came in five weeks later, he said something to me in the mess hall, and I didn't even recognize him. Because the last time I'd seen him, he had long hair, and he was in his first week, he made your own every he made everybody look alike. It was called Squirrel Week. And believe me, they were going to break you down, and you were together for 12 weeks. I mean, you went everywhere together. And it did a lot as far as bringing different groups together. Another question? Do you remember where you were during the Tet Offensive? Yeah, I got into Vietnam about three or four months after that, and they said, the replacements are here. <laughs> Another question? Asking about communicating with family, uh, how often did you get to talk? What was it like being not being able to? That, that's the way it was in Vietnam. But uh, when I was in uh, Iraq, uh, there was a bank of phones everywhere. You could call home anytime you wanted to. You just probably had to wait 15 or 20 minutes, and you'd get your five minutes, and the next guy would come along. They were all free calls, and uh, I got uh, the news that everything at the house broke. So. <laughs> Yeah, honey, do list a mile long waiting for you, right? Yeah. I'll say one thing as far as marriages. Uh, textbooks mention a number of people killed, and I got three high school classmates whose names are on that wall in Washington. And none of you signed yearbooks, you know, the crystal ball. Um, but they also mention a number of people wounded, but they don't mention all the other things as far as uh, Dear John letters. I got married December uh, 14, 1968, went in the Navy in 69 and the marriage didn't survive the service. And when I went back in uh, for a year in 76, uh, there were nine people in my office, all been in during Vietnam, and every one of them had been, was divorced. And one of my best friends a year ahead of me in school, my hometown, he got drafted, he was in Vietnam uh, when I was getting ready to go into service, and I saw him after he got out, and I got out, uh, back in New Jersey, and he was married to his second wife. But when he got R&R uh, &R in Hawaii, uh, he knew then, when his wife flew in, that their marriage was empty. And those statistics don't get put in textbooks. Got another question over here? Check one, two, one, two. How did the uh, Vietnam War affect your emotional life on a daily perspective? <laughs> well, I got back from Vietnam, and uh, for at least two or three years, any kind of 
loud noise, I would, I would, I would, I would just jump. And, uh, after Vietnam, I used to really like firecrackers. I can't stand them now. <laughs> and, uh, since, uh, the army training in Vietnam, I doubt if I slept more than four hours a night. I, I sleep four hours every night and that's it. I'm ready to get up. Let's go. They need to say something about how they were treating the Yeah, that, that's, that, yeah, I'm sure somebody, uh, but did y'all want to take a moment to talk about that? I mean, that's something that we talked about in class was how, uh, you know, what we were just talking about a moment ago, that it's just in recent years that uh, our Vietnam vets have started to kind of be appreciated for what they did, but I know as far as my dad was concerned, he said he couldn't get that uniform off fast enough when he got back home, and for a lot of years just didn't talk about it, but uh, could you talk a little bit about your treatment when you came back home? Well, uh, I guess just a couple years ago when I got back from Iraq, I wrote a little story about it, and Tessa got it, and she, she passes it out to her class. She says she passes it out to her class every year. Uh, coming back from Vietnam, you were just, you were treated like dirt. You couldn't, you, you'd go to get a job, and they would, you know, during the interviews, they have you ever had a real job? I'm going, well, uh, I'm a helicopter pilot, I need a job. And uh, people just looked at you differently. They spoke at you differently. They didn't want to associate with you. Uh, it, it was horrible. Uh, fast forward, what, 35 years? Uh, I came back from Iraq, got off the airplane here in uh, Atlanta in my khaki uniform. I was mobbed by the UFO, USO. <laughs> And all these people coming up and giving me hugs, going out of the car, there's people honking the horn, shaking my hand. I go to a gas station to fill up the car with my wife and kids. Somebody comes across and pays for my gas. I go to the National Guard unit. We go to the Waffle House and go up to pay. It's been paid for. And that's, that happened in a lot of restaurants. And uh, what I like now is you, I walk around and I see people with the Vietnam veteran hat on. First thing I do is go up and welcome home, brother. And that really lightens, a person just lights right up after that. And uh, because they weren't welcome home. And uh, I feel better about it now. <laughs> Got another question over here? sign up and do it right now. It was my pleasure every minute of it. Wow. It's the same thing. I, I would have done, done all over again. In fact, you don't get do-overs in life. And a buddy of mine uh, and I took a nostalgic trip to Texas. He was in the Air Force in the early 60s. I've been back to my old base in Kingsville twice in the last three years. And both times, if, if I had to do it over again, when I went back for the divorce in December 73, I get back to the base and re enlist and stayed active. I was smart enough, in hindsight, to get in the reserves and never regretted that. But if I had to do it over again, I'd have done the whole time on active service. Were you guys like sexy, or did you guys see Agent Orange take I got some sprayed on the, the helicopter that I was flying and a couple of the uh, landing zones that would be landed in. All the dust had Agent Orange in it and got in the aircraft. 
but i count myself fortunate that i don't think i've been affected by it i do have some friends that have passed away because of it and are still affected by it today a friend i lost three weeks ago of the five of us that went in in 69 uh it's the luck of the draw uh one of them billy newberry after his training spent his first year in vietnam as a door gunner in a helicopter and he was sprayed with agent orange then he did a second tour in vietnam in a fighter squadron and three weeks ago he died of cancer and he didn't go it took him two and a half weeks after he was diagnosed and one of america's heroes in my mind when i was in philadelphia i was also with him a summer in 81 in newport but a navy friend of mine a master chief went in world war ii at age 18 1942 did three years convoy duty north atlantic world war ii got in reserves got called up during korea did two more years active in korea uh was a bulldozer operator in civilian life became a cv was a master chief his whole battalion got mobilized in vietnam he spent nine months in country and he died of agent orange in 2001 it's pretty worse than agent orange to go asking what would y'all say was the most difficult part about being involved in being on war? Basically probably the uh, for me the political struggle and why we were there and the hatred that we that we felt from the American people it's it's just the, all the politics is what what really got you know got to me, but uh, just uh, grin and bear it and go through it. And your country asks you to do something, you do whatever they tell you to do. And uh, I got out of it all right, so I'm good. She wanted to know if there was ever a moment for Mr. Mr. Fake. Obviously, Mr. Haynes, you, you talked about your experiences. She was she was wondering, Mr. Fake, if there was ever a point where you felt like you you might die. Well, not like Bob here. I didn't I didn't exactly have to pull the trigger, but I took the people to do that, and they had the door gunners in the back. Well, well, part of the job. Uh, that this, I was telling Bob here, I'm pretty lucky. I was the only pilot in my unit for a year that did not take an enemy hit. People were shot down in front of me and in back of me. <laughs> of course, the ones that were shot down in front of me, I'd go land next to them and pick the crew up, leave the helicopter, we're out of here. <laughs> but uh, I did uh, crash one time, but it, it was a little minor crash, but uh, it really wasn't my fault. But, <laughs> well, maybe it was a little bit. But, uh, it's over with. And... <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? Ms. Duxworth over here, one of our fine ROTC students. What are some of your most memorable missions? <laughs> Basically, for me, the, the most of the missions every day were about the same uh, to take troops into a, to LZs where they would get out and go do the fighting, and I would come back to a little safe place and wait on them. Uh, probably one of the most memorable ones is uh, there's a Black Virgin Mountain. Where was that? You know about that? Yeah. Uh, and this was an old volcano cone, and it was all flat around it. And up on the top, 90% of the time, it was a fog bank right on the top. But there was an Air Force base or CIA base up there or something. CIA. Yeah, CIA. And, and I, I went to uh, Benoit to pick up some Air Force people and some other sneaky pe people to take them to the top of this mountain. And uh, my co-pilot had only been in Vietnam. I'd been there for six months, and the co-pilot had only been there a month. 
And we circled and circled and waited till the fog broke and went and landed on the pad and had some coffee and they did their thing. And, uh, we went to take off. And uh, we had, there was clouds. You had to go through a bank of clouds, maybe a quarter of a mile, to get to, and it was crystal clear blue outside. And so you do an instrument takeoff, just like they do in airplanes at airports when the weather's bad. And I said, well, you know, I haven't done one of these in a while, I'll try it. <laughs> so we set it up, set all the instruments up, and did the uh, takeoff into the clouds. You, you can't see anything but white in front of you. And you just use your instruments. Uh, apparently one of my instruments was not working correctly. <laughs> And it's like a hard official horizon, and the pilot has to follow that horizon to stay straight. Yeah. And the new guy next to me says, uh, I think you got vertigo or something's wrong. I, I, I want to take the aircraft. I says, you got it. <laughs> and he straightened it out, pulled it out of the clouds, and saved all our lives. Uh, part two. I got here to Atlanta. Same guy is running a little agency in Congress. <laughs> I went down and hugged him. I said, Fred, you saved all of us. He said, what are you talking about? I told him the story. He said, oh, I remember that. <laughs>
wasn't clear, but um, yeah, I mean, in our high school class, we never even had the history class. Now, you didn't know about Vietnam. Remember a kid across the street, when he came back in 65, he was in the local newspaper, and they had him pointing to Vietnam on the globe, pointing out where it had been, because it's like people back then that here didn't know where it was. But it sure got in the map the next few years. Well, I guess uh, when I was in high school and the draft was going on, got my senior year going along, and about two weeks before graduation, uh, got the draft notice. So uh, I'll tell this story to Tesla a couple times. Uh, so I went and failed the 12th grade. How about that? Well, they couldn't draft me if it was in summer school. <laughs> okay, along comes I failed summer school. I had to go back for a second year uh, and only took two subjects. I was surfing by 10.30 every day. Uh, end of the 12th grade, here comes the draft notice. So I failed the subject again, went to <laughs> summer school. And uh, that's about the time I went and said, you know, let's get this over with. The war's not going to be over and uh, my country wants me, I'll, I'll go do it. And uh, that's the way it turned out. I'm in theater, and we're doing a play called Keep My Heart. It has to do with the Americans in the Vietnam War. So I want to know, like, what were your thoughts on them? Or, like, were, were the nurses affected by the Muslims? What? The nurses. <laughs> That's not the nurses in Vietnam. They're in the theater about to do a production. <laughs> 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 Let's just say they got a lot of on site training. <laughs> You guys spoke about uh, how you guys helped train some highly tried. So, how did they prepare you for the Vietnam War itself? Because, I mean, the U.S. Army has never faced anything like this. Did they teach you anything? They uh, didn't hardly get any training um, for Vietnam. I mean, we got the, uh, you know, how to do all the maneuvers for me as a pilot. But uh, we didn't get any uh, history or, I mean, maybe one hour talk about Vietnam. They, uh, they didn't tell us, you know, what the country was like or what we we're going to be doing. It's just, here, here's your ticket. You're out of here. Uh, let's jump forward 30 years. <laughs> going to Iraq, they, well, we went up to Pennsylvania, the whole National Guard unit, and we spent two weeks training how to fight in the desert and how to go house to house and fight. And uh, they trained us in the weapons, the AK-47 and a couple other things in case we were down and we had to grab that weapon and use it. But uh, and we were all, most of us pilots going, I'm not gonna fight house to house. <laughs> I come on ride, I'm out of here. <laughs> and, uh, but there was a lot more training for Iraq. I think the military learned their lesson to train the troops a little bit better for the area that they're going to uh, today. Which she's asking which one was worse. I'm not sure if she's referring to politically or, like just or conditions on the ground. Well, politically, they're both messed up. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> but it just, as far as uh, blood and carnage, I just think Vietnam was. I believe blood and carnage Vietnam was absolutely. Uh, could, could you tell us about the Hold on, let's see if we got another one. Oh, hold on, one right over here. in the 60s with the, when we landed on the moon, finally. 
So they're saying, were you around when America was? Um, yeah, yeah. When, when I was in a girl's apartment in San Diego. <laughs>
That's what you learn from it, not to take this for granted. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> In your opinion, how was the transition of uh, training for the Cold War to the guerrilla tactics? I I explained in class that uh, up until we had gone into the Vietnam War in '65, that most of our soldiers at that point had been trained for a ground war with the Soviets and really had not been prepared. What was she asking about the the, the Cold War? Oh, yeah. I think the military had to, uh, after after Korea, had to change all the tactics, and uh, they're still changing today. You mentioned earlier that you thought they were training better today, whereas you in the yeah, the training today is, is much more intense and uh, specific to the area that you're going to. What are your thoughts involving the domino theory? Well, uh, as a political idea, I mean, everybody in the world questioned it, people here questioned it, and the idea that, I mean, it proved to be a fallacious theory, but it definitely got us there. Um, also, uh, as far as that Cold War question, uh, I spent 20, my 29 years active in reserve, uh, Naval Reserve Intelligence, and that was still the prime order of business up until 1991. I mean, we still did things geared uh, to Cold War. Um, how did y'all react to any like surprise attack or ambush that y'all encountered during the war? With extreme prejudice. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's the answer. With extreme prejudice. You don't think, you don't do that. It's all about tunnel vision, it's all about being highly trained, it's all about you know what to do. It's extreme prejudice. The, uh, the base that I was on, uh, like I said, I was surrounded by 5,000 Thai soldiers. And uh, from what I gather, the Thais have never been defeated. Uh, our base was attacked once by uh, some uh, Viet Cong or whatever. The next day, we had a mission to take the ties out on a little trip. They came back with four heads, stuck them on poles around the base. We were never attacked again. transition from Johnson to Nixon that affected the war, like affected in the tactics or the missions in the SMB and anything like that. Transition from the Johnson administration to the Nixon administration. What was what what were the differences that you saw? I didn't know anything about politics. I was just doing what I was doing. <laughs> That's right. It wasn't political for us, y'all. We were in there fighting. Yeah. I'll say something. Beware of politicians lying to you, because uh, 1964 <laughs> September, Johnson gave a speech that 55 Americans were killed in Vietnam, and it's 55 too many. And his Republican opponent was Barry Goldwater, and when he was asked about Vietnam, his policy was he knew him back in the Stone Age, and people thought this guy's a real warmonger and was scared of him, and Johnson won in the biggest popular electoral landslide in U.S. presidential history, and when he was finished, he could add three zeros to 55. And then as far as Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon campaigned in 68, and he kept talking about he had a plan to win the war. And there's a, a great series uh, on fear from 1945 to 85 called 4585 by CBS News, uh, Peter Jones. And one of the most poignant moments, Nixon was interviewed after he was president, and Peter Jones asked him, what was your plan? And he laughed and said, we didn't have one. It's just politics. They didn't have a point. Just trying to get away. Uh, have you been to the Vietnam Memorial, and what was it like? Your first experience seeing the wall for the first time on the main. I have not been to the wall. I have not wanted to go to the wall. I've, I've been up there uh, twice. Uh, I had some friends that were. Uh, killed in Vietnam for pilots, and uh, just just 
wanted to uh, pay my respects. And the, uh, everybody calls me Richard, but my first name's John. And I went and looked in the book, and there was a warrant officer, Richard Fink, got killed, and I said, that's not me. <laughs> I've seen him in Washington twice. I've seen him moving the wall a couple times. The first time I saw it, three of my, I mentioned three of my high school classmates were in there. And I taught history for 31 years, and I could talk about World War I, uh, Civil War, you name it. When I went to Holy Rock, Scotland for Navy duty, they had a monument right there in Dunoon. I counted 311 names of 10,000 10, that got killed in World War I. I could talk about that in class. When I came back and tried to talk about the Vietnam War, I couldn't do it. Is there, it was is there a reason personal. specifically you don't want to see the wall? I remember all my friends every uh, Memorial Day. And I process their names. And hold their lives. Um, I just want to take you back to when you got your draft notice. Did your parents try to stop you at all or keep you from going and say, let's go to Canada instead of being drafted? How did they react? Yeah, my dad was in uh, World War II and was wounded on D Day plus four. And uh, kind of grew up in a military family. Uh, actually went to school in uh, Germany and uh, England. And uh, when my country called me, I said, I'll go. My father was an Irish immigrant. Uh, he was a sergeant in the Army in World War II, spent 23 months combat duty. I'm here because they dropped the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. My dad, after 23 months combat duty, was being retrained to the invasion of Japan, where we expect to get 100,000 of these casualties up to a million. And instead, he got discharged, and I'm the first wave of baby boomers. The very first wave. But anyway, uh, Scotch Irish household, it wasn't any thought about going to Canada. Uh, Scotch Irish have missed for more than centuries. Maybe just it was also one of those things like we take a crisis today, we take a SWAT teams for granted, things like this. But what you basically had at Kent State, you had students, some were protesting, uh, you had other students or kids the same age, National Guard, they had never been trained for riot duty. There had been no training for that. I mean, it was just like you know, in Boston, and then of course it got played up in the newspapers, magazines. And, and also, somebody's going to write a book someday about protests in Vietnam, during the Vietnam War. And the year before I got to the University of Tennessee, uh, 16,000 students, January, it snowed, uh, Saturday morning classes, no interstate back then. The facts that really happened, January 65. A handful of students were throwing cars, snowballs at cars and coming around it. About 16 kids out of 16,000. 18 wheeler came down, a kid from Connecticut threw an ice ball at the guy's windshield. The guy reached under his seat, pulled out a pistol, rolled the window down, and blew the UT student dead in the snow. Okay, you're not going to sell Time magazine 1965 saying 16 kids throwing snowballs uh, caused trouble. The very next week, Time Magazine had it ran through the boards of UT men running wild over the campus trying to take over the administration. That sold magazines in 1965. Somebody's going to write a history of Vietnam protests and quote that Time Magazine. I'll tell you, when I got to UT the next year, when it snowed, they had so many rent cops that you couldn't make a snowball. And then also, reaction to Time Magazine, a week, a week after that, uh, a congressman from Memphis, Tennessee, and Memphis is not even in Tennessee, he might as well be in Mississippi. It's 400 miles from Knoxville. He got up on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives with a new bill to clamp down student riots. He said, even my own university in Tennessee, he held up Time magazine, and it was all fictitious. It, it didn't happen. 
And you wonder how many other things were like that. The media will lie to you also. Any other questions? Yep. Got one over here. Three. Good. Good, good, good. I'm just thinking y'all running out of ideas. I thought y'all did your homework. All right. Were you um, ready to go to war again when the Cold War came around? No, like, you know, we almost went to war in the Cold War through Russia. Wait, you mean like Cuba or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't old enough. We were too young. We were too young for that. Oh. For your age. For younger children. Before y'all left to come back home, did y'all bring anything like a souvenir or anything? Well, from Vietnam, they really wouldn't let us bring anything. I, I brought my, like a little TV and some of the equipment that, you know, I had a map that I used and uh, a couple other little things, but uh, that was it. Anybody? Anybody else? Yeah, I'm asking questions. Some of you other guys, I know y'all brought questions. I see papers everywhere, but nobody's... Do you think the media gave an accurate portrayal of the war? No. That's all I got for you guys. I had to leave a little early, so I didn't get to finish the rest. But I hope you guys enjoyed for what I got. That was a good hour of recording, so hope you guys can use that for some valuable information or for a project or something. Well, that was it. Hope you guys subscribe. See you guys later.